Okay, it's one o'clock, um, everybody, and I think we might um, get going. I can just see people um, still uh, jumping on, um, but um, uh, given uh, time pressures these days, we will get started. So thank you, everybody, um, for joining us uh, today for the Kirby Institute seminar series. Uh, my name is Gail Matthews. I'm head of uh, the TVRP program at the Kirby Institute um, and also an infectious disease physician um, at St. Vincent's Hospital. So I have a particular interest in the topic of today's um, uh, lecture. Now, I'd just like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of, of the lands on which we gather today, and that's the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and pay my respects to their elders past and present. And I extend that respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples um, joining us today. So just some housekeeping to start off with, I'm sure you're all very familiar of how these seminars um, run, um, but essentially I'm going to hand over in a, in a moment to Dominic, who's going to give us the, the presentation, um, and then we're going to have some time for a Q&A at the end. And so if you can ask questions either throughout the presentation or at the end, um, but it's great if you can put them in at, at, uh, throughout, so we have them there, um, at the bottom by clicking on the Q&A um, icon at the bottom of your screens and then we'll, we'll deal with those um, when the presentation's finished. Um, but uh, that's it, um, and it only leaves me now uh, to welcome our speaker today, Professor Dominic Dwyer. Uh, Dominic is the Director of New South Wales Health Pathology, Public Health Pathology, and also the Director of the Institute uh, of Clinical Pathology and Medical Research at Westmead Hospital. Uh, and Dominic is a longtime collaborator of uh, the Kirby Institute, in particular in regards to the Inside HIV studies, uh, and I'm sure many of you um, will know him, but I'll just uh, give a brief uh, further introduction. So Dominic uh, is a virologist and also an infectious disease physician at Westmead Hospital in Sydney University. Um, he has a, a very uh, long-standing um, and uh, uh, respectable history in uh, a clinical research interest in uh, viral diseases of all kinds, particularly those of, of a significant public health importance, including COVID-19, influenza, and other respiratory respiratory viruses, arboviruses, HIV, and also an antiviral drug resistance. And he's been actively involved in investigations of outbreaks of viral infections, including at mass gatherings uh, and closed environments. And many of you would be very familiar um, with some of the excellent work that he, he did um, with regards to the um, COVID-19 uh, outbreak and origins in, in Wuhan, China, alongside the WHO. Um, we're not going to ask him to talk about COVID-19 today because we're all a bit um, sick of COVID-19. Instead, we're going to ask him to talk um, about another viral infection. Uh, and the title of his talk is More Virus Drama, The Emergence of Japanese Encephalitis in Australia. Thank you, Dominic. Thank you very much, Gail, for the introduction. I work on Baromedical Country here at, uh, at Westmead, but a lot of this work has been done across many uh, uh, lands in New South Wales and else elsewhere in Australia. So look, uh, uh, Gail's asked me to talk on the emergence of Japanese encephalitis in Australia, uh, just when we thought things were quietening down with COVID, which of course they aren't. Uh, we've had uh, Japanese encephalitis and uh, uh, monkeypox appear in, in the last uh, couple of months, just to, to add to everyone's workload. So look, I'm going to talk about uh, Japanese encephalitis. It's an arbovirus, of course, uh, as you're well aware. Uh, and arboviruses have a specific definition. Uh, they're, they're essentially uh, viruses that are transmitted between susceptible vertebrates uh, by insects of one form or another, uh, mostly, but there are also some other slightly unusual uh, transmissions and so on, which we, we won't necessarily talk about. And the arboviruses are often sort of discussed as a group, but in fact, there are a number of different ways they can be classified. You can do the typical virology classification based on, on, on phenotype and genotype, of course. Uh, also, they're classified on the basis of their vector, be it mosquitoes, ticks, sandflies, or what have you. Uh, also, by the mode of transmission in that they can be transmitted from animal to arthropod to man, such as with JE. Uh, or animal to arthropod to, to, to uh, animal uh, and so on. Uh, so there are a range of different sort of transmissions involving both vectors and hosts. They can also be classified on the basis of disease. And I suspect with, with this audience, that's what we're probably most familiar with. Uh, encephalitic viruses such as JE, and I'll talk about those a bit more, uh, but there are other important uh, presentations of arboviral diseases that are actually quite common and important in Australia. 
Uh, and they can also be discussed in the context of their reservoirs, whether they're in birds, such as with JE, or in pigs as well, as we'll discuss later, or indeed other animal species. Now, if you look at the encephalitic arboviruses, again, there's a range of those from different viral families. And I won't go in, into those in detail. You can read them there. But there are a number of course that occur in Australia. Murray Valley encephalitis is the one that we're probably most familiar with, uh, even though it's a, a relatively uncommon disease. It does occur in most states of Australia. We also have Kunjin, which is a, essentially a, a strain of West Nile virus. And now, of course, we have Japanese encephalitis. Uh, and dengue can and co cause a encephalopathic uh, kind of illness, I guess, not really uh, uh, Australian virus, if you like, but does occur in outbreaks in Australia. And of course, there's a whole lot of other ones there listed with often quite exotic and interesting names. Now, you can look around the world where these viruses, these flaviviruses tend to gather, the neurotropic ones. And so uh, you see that, that, for example, in the USA or in the North America, uh, you have St. Louis encephalitis virus. Uh, then you have other viruses in different parts of the world. Murray Valley, of course, is the one in Australia. Uh, and JE is the one that, that is sort of most common in, in China, India, and Southeast Asia. Uh, and that's obviously the subject of, of the discussion today. And there are other number of other uh, types of encephalitic flaviviruses that cause problems in Europe and Central Asia. Now, going back to the Australian arboviral diseases, again, to put it in context, as I mentioned, we, 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 there are the encephalitic ones like MVE and Kunjin and JE, but uh, the, the viruses that are associated with polyarthritis or polyarthralgias, such as Ross River and Barma Forest, are quite important viruses in terms of their caseload uh, in Australia and in New South Wales. Uh, some of these may present essentially with a fever and rash, and that's typical of Barma Forest. If anyone knows where Barma Forest is, it's down on, on the Murray in the, in the New South Wales Victorian border. And then you have febrile illnesses with a range of these viruses. And again, there are other viruses at the bottom there that uh, have been isolated in Australia. They are only in Australia. Um, and whether they cause human disease or not is uncertain. Certainly, they don't cause significant human disease. Now, let's look at JE itself. It's a flavivirus, obviously. It's a fairly complex sort of group serologically. I won't go into that detail. Um, it's an RNA virus enveloped. Uh, and there are a number of different genotypes, one to five, and that becomes important as, as, as you'll see later on. The key with JE is that it's the commonest cause of viral encephalitis in, in Asia. Uh, probably, uh, you know, look, the, the, the figures vary, but uh, around 100,000 uh, cases a year. And there's currently an outbreak in, in some of the states of India at the moment. The incubation period is, you know, varies. It can be quite long, up to a couple of weeks. Uh, and the other key point about JE, as, it, as with some of the other encephalitic flaviviruses, that only a small proportion actually develop encephalitis and that the great majority of cases are asymptomatically uh, affected or infected. The case fatality rate, it's sort of variable depending on the type of study and so on. But in general terms, it's around 20 odd percent uh, of people who get encephalitis uh, die of it. And of course, many of the remainder have significant neurologic problems. So it's, you know, it's an, an important, if not uncommon, uh, uh, clinical presentation, at least in Australia. Water birds are the natural host uh, of, of uh, JE uh, and mosquitoes, as we'll discuss later, are the vector. And the important thing here is that pigs are the uh, amplifiers of the virus. In other words, pigs get infected and produce very large amounts of virus, uh, which then becomes a, an amplification source of virus for mosquitoes to take on to, to, to other um, animals, if you like. And generally, the pigs are asymptomatically uh, infected, except in, in pregnant sows, where abortion and fe fetal abnormalities uh, are common. And in fact, that's the way this this uh, uh, it, it, this was the alert to the J presence of JE in Australia. Again, I'm sure many of you know this already in the audience, but the, the presentations of these encephalitic viruses can be quite wide, uh, ranging from the majority being asymptomatic infection up to 
severe encephalomyelitis, um, uh, in, including AFP and Guillain-Barre and, and things like that. And as we've seen with some other flaviviruses, uh, congenital abnormalities uh, uh, may occur with things like Zika, although not obviously described with uh, Japanese encephalitis. And you can have a number of other much milder illnesses, febrile illnesses and so on, which may not lead to uh, presentation to medical services, meaning that it's often very hard to understand the true impact of, of, this, of viruses in the community. Now, you also need to look at the, whether these viruses are, are endemic or epidemic in terms of who gets infected. So if you have endemic areas, for example, in many uh, countries in, in Southeast Asia and parts of China and India and so on, then in those sorts of environments, the disease is usually one of childhood or early adulthood adulthood with, with, with encephalitis. And disease in older adults is sort of more unlikely because uh, those adults have probably been exposed in the past and are therefore presumably uh, 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 immune to second infection, although that's uncertain. So, for example, in the Kimberley, where Murray Valley encephalitis is, you know, reasonably common, it's a disease of childhood, mostly Indigenous children, um, and uh, adults are, are rarely infected unless they come into the area. Um, so we've seen a number of cases over the years, for example, in uh, European backpackers who come to the Kimberley to work and then get Murray Valley encephalitis um, uh, uh, because they've not had any flavivirus exposure in the past. In areas where uh, uh, it's new, it's an epidemic area, then everybody is susceptible and the risk of infection depends on the nature of exposure. As I said before, who gets encephalitis is, is you know, somewhat uncertain, but with all of them, there's significantly more asymptomatic infections than there are encephalitic presentations. And with JE, it's in the range of one in a couple of hundred uh, infections will, will develop encephalitis. And there are a range of reasons for this, including whether people have been exposed, perhaps in the past, uh, uh, age of presentation, genetic susceptibility, those sort of usual things. And I think it's also fair to say that the, the disease is, is often significantly underdiagnosed in countries where it's common. Now, this is the sort of, this is a life cycle of, of JE. So the natural cycle is really between Culex mosquitoes uh, and waterfowl, um, which are the, the, the uh, sort of natural carriers, asymptomatic carriers of the, of the uh, virus. Uh, and that is a normal cycle uh, between those groups. Uh, humans can be infected essentially as a dead end host in the same way that other animals can be, such as horses um, and, uh, and cattle and you know, llamas, for what that's worth. Dogs and goats can also be infected. Uh, and chickens uh, can also be infected. And that's why we use them as sentinel uh, flocks or sentinel, sentinels for Japanese encephalitis and other flaviviruses. The key with JE is at the bottom, as I said before, uh, that pigs uh, uh, can certainly be infected after mosquito bites and produce large amounts of virus uh, and therefore act as an amplifying uh, uh, kind of host, if you like, uh, for the virus in endemic areas. <clears throat> and this can be in commercial piggeries, uh, which is important because, again, uh, that has both an e economic impact as well as a somewhat of an early warning system. Uh, but domestic pigs, of course, not necessarily necessarily very common in Australia, but certainly common in other parts of, of, of Southeast Asia. Uh, feral pigs uh, is important. Uh, we have a lot of feral pigs in Australia, as you're all aware, um, and, and uh, they uh, may well be making a contribution to this emergence. Uh, and you can use pigs as sentinel herds, and this is what's done up in the far north of Queensland. I said before, too, that there, there are various genotypes, five of them. The interesting thing here, and, and they have a, a sort of rough geographic association as well. Uh, what was What's interesting about what's going on in Australia is that this has been identified as genotype four, which is the least common of all of those genotypes. The vaccine strain of, is genotype three, and in fact does give cross protection. Um, but genotype four is relatively uncommon. 
but where it is picked up is in Indonesia, uh, in PNG, although it's not on the map, uh, and, and of course now in Australia. So an uncom relatively uncommon genotype, but uh, again, th there's probably uh, a significant under sampling of, of, of them. Now, in terms of the history of JE in Australia, uh, until recently, there was really only seen in travellers who were returning from Southeast Asia. And, and there'd been about a dozen cases uh, reported and diagnosed up until 2016. There was a single person who returned from Bali in 2018 uh, with, with JE, and that's important because of the genotype that person had. Um, there have been, um, however, a couple of outbreaks in the Torres Strait. So Badu Island, which is, uh, uh, you can see on the map there, about midway between Cape York and PNG. Um, and there were a couple of cases on Badu Island uh, in, uh, in 1995. And, and, and this is kind of important because again, as I'm sure you're aware, there's been transmission of a range of infectious diseases across the Torres Strait, tuberculosis being one, drug resistant tuberculosis, uh, HIV for that matter as well. Uh, and it really relates to the movement of peoples between PNG and Cape York and, and the Torres Strait Islands back and forward across. Um, and and uh, uh, again, uh, I, uh, that, you know, that's a source of infection. Then in 1998, again, another case on Badu Island, and this time one on the Cape York Peninsula. Um, and uh, 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 sentinel herds were put in, and there were some infections in sentinel pigs on, on, in Cape York as well. Um, so clearly there was some virus activity in, in, in that area, but none uh, in the couple of years, none in the, the sort of couple of decades since. Then there was a case on the Tiwi Islands in early March 2021. Um, and again, uh, that's important because that too turned out to be genotype four. And of course, this year, we've now had 29 cases across four states of, of Australia. And this is a, a map that was sort of written up early in the year uh, after cases were first identified in, in Australia. And you can see that the, 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 the fully shaded area is the normal uh, uh, geography of, of JE. Um, but of course, now we've got cases in Queensland, New South Wales, Victoria and South Australia. And in fact, you can probably add the Northern Territory to that as well, um, because a number of feral pigs have been, uh, 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 had Japanese encephalitis um, they were pigs from the Northern Territory. So clearly it's, um, it, it's fairly widespread. Now the mosquitoes are important, obviously, uh, for, uh, for various reasons. Culex and annular rostrus is the main carrier of JE. Um, and it's, an, it's a common uh, mosquito in Australia. Um, and it annoys people intensely. It's a, one of the ones that people complain about. Uh, but certainly widespread across uh, uh, mainland Australia, often common in summer, early autumn, all depending on the rainfall and temperature. And this becomes a bit of a theme that, that the, the interactions between the mosquitoes and the environment and the rain and the birds and so on is a very dynamic one. Uh, and so, you know, it's not easy to sort of outline uh, management issues in each of those areas. Anyway, with Culex annular rostrus, freshwater habitats mostly included wet, wetlands, fa uh, farm dams and the like, uh, irrigated agriculture and so on, and of course floods. And that's been what has been uh, you know, clearly a significant issue in the last year or so. It feeds on a whole range of different animals and importantly can disperse up to about 12 kilometres from its sort of larval habitat. So that's important in trying to understand uh, how widespread infection might be in a specific location. It's also uh, quite capable of, of transmitting various arboviruses, including Japanese uh, encephalitis. And it takes about seven to 10 days for what's called the extrinsic incubation period in a mosquito um, to, 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 to producing a, a virus when it goes on blood feeds. There are, however, other mosquitoes in, involved as well, other Culex species, which also can, can, can tolerate JE, if you like. Um, and again, these are found in a range of different uh, uh, locations associated with water, the sorts of things that you're going to see everywhere. 
these, uh, these other Keelex species don't tend to travel as far as annular rostrus um, and have a perhaps lower level to capacity to transmit arboviruses. For all of you that have flown into Australia on aeroplanes and remember the fogging uh, and the spraying of aeroplanes, either while you're sitting there or indeed before you get on, which is what happens now, uh, that's all designed to prevent the importation of uh, mosquito species that might be important, particularly Aedes albopictus and uh, some of these other ones important for dengue and malaria, but also other Culex species. So Culex uh, gelidus is the, um, is the one that's most associated with JE transmission in India um, and has been now detected in Australia in various locations, imported most likely through travel and is now present in North Australia. And so that has particularly good capacity for carrying JE. Then there's a, a plenty of other sort of floodwater mosquitoes, mosquitoes, Edes and so on that can be involved in, in transmission. One of the important things about some of these mosquito species is that the virus can survive in mosquito eggs, which can be become desiccated and so survive over winter uh, to, to, to um, uh, uh, rehydrate, if that's the right term, uh, in summer. Uh, and so you can get persistence of virus throughout dry seasons when there isn't flooding because the virus is present in mosquito eggs. Uh, that, have, that have dried out. Uh, of course, along the coast, we all know there's plenty of places for mosquitoes, um, and, and that's some of the uh, Aedes uh, vigilax and other species, but their role in JE transmission is considered to be pretty low. And that's why this is much more of an inland disease than a, than a, than a, a, a coastal disease. And this is just some old data looking at the, the competence of these various mosquito species to Japanese encephalitis, and indeed, this paper has a range of other viruses as well. Uh, but you can see the Culex uh, gelidus species, you know, very easy to, to infect and transmit, and same with Culex annular rostris as well, and more so in some of the other uh, uh, mosquitoes that are, that are important. So again, understanding the species of, of mosquitoes that are present where disease is present, is, is a guide to the like to to what might be the likely ongoing transmission. Um, so the mosquito species is important. So let's move to what happened then this year. So in early in February uh, 2022, the Department of Primary Industry and ACDP, the Australian Centre for Disease Prevention, I think it's called, uh, with the old Geelong uh, Animal Laboratories, uh, confirmed Japanese encephalitis, surprisingly, in samples from commercial piggeries in a couple of states. And this was because uh, uh, you know, the, the, the commercial piggery industry, like any of our sort of uh, animal um, uh, production, is highly regulated uh, and time dependent. Uh, and so they were starting to see the cycle of sows delivering, then producing piglets, which then go on to, you know, become bacon and what have you, um, uh, that, that, that a higher proportion than normal were, were born with congenital abnormalities, and they were sent off for a range of tests. Nobody thought to do JE because JE isn't, uh, you know, regarded as being endemic in Australia. So it took a little bit of, of time. But anyway, eventually, uh, JE was confirmed by, by PCR, by culture and so on. Uh, the other thing that's surprising is a large number of piggeries that there are, commercial piggeries. So, for example, uh, there are at least 30 or more than 30 affected piggeries, plus all the ones that aren't affected in New South Wales, and a very large number of them are down along, uh, you know, in the Murrumbidgee uh, and Murray irrigation areas. Um, and so, you know, again, that's kind of important. Uh, the disease was then recognised in commercial piggeries in South Australia, and a couple of feral pigs in the Northern Territory have been identified as carrying Japanese encephalitis as well. And this is uh, uh, all due to genotype four, which, as I said, is relative, you know, has been regarded as being one of the, un the uncommon genotype. It wasn't obviously related to pig movements, Pigs apparently don't move around a lot between 
um, uh, abattoirs, uh, sorry, between piggeries, uh, which are somewhat different to, to some cattle species and so on, where they may be moved around for, for you know, fattening up and, and what have you. However, um, uh, uh, pigs, uh, 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 boars used for uh, uh, insemination and so on uh, have been found to be infected and in fact the virus present in uh, semen of those animals. So this is just sort of an idea of, of the congenital abnormalities that, that have been described in pigs, fairly, you know, kind of horrifying photographs. And, and, and uh, obviously uh, veterinarians uh, would understand the significance, but really very significant uh, and destructive central nervous system involvement uh, with, with infection. The other thing that was striking, and this is work from a colleague at DPI, was a number of sort of uh, 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 litters being, uh, uh, numbers of pigs in litters being affected. And as the outbreak has continued on, you know, the proportion of pigs uh, in litters that were infected uh, was really becoming very high. So that, you know, half of them were, 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 were the litters were affected by JE, which obviously has a tremendous uh, economic impact um, uh, and concern. Um, and it's also important, one of the things that's uh, also of note is that in the, in the pigs that are born uh, and then become the sows that do the next sort of breeding cycle, that if you look at the timing of that, there'll be a very large number of sows going into the breeding cycle in early summer, this, this coming summer, um, uh, that, that, that it will actually be seronegative. Um, so, you know, this is one, again, one of the concerns about uh, uh, what that means for the likelihood of JE returning. So let's look at the human cases now. So uh, again, 29 cases have been definitively uh, diagnosed uh, and there is a laboratory case definition around that. Uh, there's, a, a cert, again, some probable cases uh, as well. Five deaths um, uh, have, have been recorded um, and some significant abnormalities in, in the people who have survived. In New South Wales, we've had 13 cases, uh, mostly in men, uh, about a 15% death rate, from obviously a small number. The age group is sort of older, remembering that in endemic areas, the age group is much, much younger, although one child has certainly been uh, infected in, 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 uh, in New South Wales. And these have mostly come from the local health districts in around Murrumbidgee, the far west, southern New South Wales, uh, and western New South Wales, of course. Um, one of the difficulties is that, of course, that people didn't know that Japanese encephalitis was around. So there's a lot of work done by the ministry to identify cases uh, by alerting clinicians, of course, uh, through various you know, uh, clinical pathways and so on, uh, ED, uh, uh, sort of warnings and so on, um, and some retrospective testing of, of people who, who died with unexplained uh, encephalitis. And uh, again, with both cases, you know, a number of the cases in New South Wales, because of where they are in New South Wales, go to Victoria to be looked after medically, uh, in the same way that you know one of the cases in Victoria is in fact infected in New South Wales. Um, so, so there's that sort of cross-border thing which can sometimes make getting the clinical data a little bit uh, tricky. All of these people were exposed between mid-January to early February, um, and public health units have gone to you know try and nut out what might be the risk, risk exposure. Um, you don't always get a, a risk exposure, but certainly a number of people uh, uh, reported fishing and other river-based sports, camping and so on along the Murray River and uh, uh, along the Darling as well, because of all the increased rain that we've, we've had in the last uh, six months or so. Um, and again, because nobody was thinking of the diagnosis, the delay in confirming infections has been uh, significant. And the areas that have been most associated with exposure include a number of towns uh, in, in the Murrumbidgee area, Corowa, Griffith, uh, and of course, along the river. And that's important for some of the Ciro survey work. I think uh, uh, it's worth highlighting the first case uh, 
temporarily in New South Wales. Uh, it was a case at St Vincent's, which is someone, an uh, elderly person had been transferred up from Wagga uh, and transferred to St Vincent's, abnormal uh, CSF at the time, nothing on routine culture and testing, but died of a progressive meningoencephalitis uh, a couple of weeks after symptom onset. And we've got a, um, a, a, a study going, or, or MRFF grant, looking at uh, uh, metagenomics as a, as a diagnostic test with a number of other places around the country. And so um, uh, Bruce Bruce team sent, uh, through Sumatic sent across uh, some of the samples for this, and uh, they were all strongly positive. All those brain biopsies were strongly positive for JE, uh, and that was confirmed then with a JE-specific PCR. And when uh, stored sera was, was sort of hunted down, again, evidence of sera conversion had occurred, and, and, and uh, that, that patient is being written up. This is just, uh, you know, from that paper. So the metagenomics uh, approach was very clear in identifying uh, 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 J. It's one of the advantages of doing metagenomics on an otherwise sterile site uh, and uh, clearly identified genu group four. Uh, and then there was some CT, also MRI uh, abnormalities. Maybe a bit hard to see on the screen. I must say, I thought they were pretty subtle, but... Um, uh, there, there, and also evidence of uh, encephalitis with, with perivascular and interstitial lymphocytic uh, uh, infiltrates uh, in the, the upper, uh, in panel B there, uh, which you may be able to see, I'm not sure. Uh, so this, these cases then sort of bring out the response to, to something that spans both human and animal um, uh, environments, you know, the whole One Health approach. So in early March, it was declared uh, as a communicable disease incident of national significance, which then itself generates a whole lot of specific uh, 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 kind of public health and laboratory and so on responses. And this pathway was going down both the animal health pathway as well as the human pathway through things like cDNA and NAMAC, which is the National Arbovirus and Malaria Advisory Committee. Um, and, and working groups formed, the One Health Plan kind of activated, remembering, of course, that, you know, like with COVID, uh, these sort of things might be coordinated uh, nationally, uh, but es essentially it's the states that implement uh, this sort of uh, work. Uh, in, in very broad terms, it's worth saying that the veterinary kind of pathways are often very comprehensive and, and quick, um, uh, more so than the human ones. And I think, to be honest, a lot of that's got to do with the recognition of the financial impact of disease in animals uh, that, that has uh, uh, on Australian finances. Anyway, so a whole range of different things. I won't go into those, um, but I'll now sort of... Oh, the other thing that's also important, I think, is that uh, there's always a tricky interaction between public health veterinary work and animal or veterinary work in particular and the industry. Uh, be it the, the, the pig industries or horse industries, including the racing industry and so on. And, and, and often this can be a bit of impediment because of the desire sometimes for secrecy and so on about the sort of issues that are being faced. So let's talk about some of the surveillance activities because this is what we do a lot of, I guess, uh, uh, at Westmead. So there's mosquito trapping, of course, which is increased because you're wanting to know what species uh, of, of mosquito are there, knowing the differences in, in vector competence and so on with the different species, uh, how likely they were to be infected and the viruses that were being identified. Um, there's also uh, uh, other virus detection work based on PCR and genomics, as well as culture from a range of uh, uh, sources, be it humans, mozzies and, and, and pigs in particular, and of course, serologic surveillance in, again, uh, humans, chickens, birds and, and, and pigs. This is what the sort of veterinary uh, kind of approach has been. They've done a lot of testing in horses and pigs. They do all of that, both prospectively and retrospectively. Uh, there is a national arbovirus monitoring program. We have, or we, I mean, the uh, vets have sentinel 
uh, cattle flocks across northern Australia, mostly looking for, for uh, diseases of veterinary importance like blue tongue and, and so on. Uh, then testing also of boars because of the, the, the way boars are used for insemination uh, and so on, uh, and also feral pigs given their large number. And, and it looks as though, in fact, that the earliest clinical signs in pigs was probably present back in December 2021, if not a little bit earlier. Uh, and those clinical signs mean that infection must have happened, you know, some weeks beforehand. So you're really looking at sort of October, November last year uh, when this was first starting to appear. Then they've identified seroconversion in pigs, evidence in, in boars uh, and so on. Again, very early in, in the year, if not late last year, and in advance of when human presentation started to, to occur. And there was sort of certainly anecdotal uh, discussion about very high mosquito numbers in late last year around the affected piggeries, given that many of them are between the Murrumbidgee and the Murray rivers. In terms of mosquito work, so uh, we rolled, or the, our entomology department rolled out mosquito uh, surveillance uh, across a whole lot of new sites in, 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 in New South Wales, often uh, allied to where commercial piggeries were. Uh, and indeed a number of, and they also went back and did retrospective testing of the normal surveillance that's done uh, on mosquitoes. Uh, and again, found that uh, by using JU specific, uh, PCR that that uh, mosquitoes in early January were found in a number of locations in in New South Wales, including locations that are fairly distant, you know, distant so between Wagga and Forbes, for example. There's also chicken flock sentinel surveillance, uh, which is uh, done. And again, a uh, chicken was identified as seroconverting in Daniloquin, uh, uh, down in the, the Murrumbidgee area um, in, in February uh, 2022. So these surveillance systems, of course, have been in place for a long time, indeed decades. So you may know that there was a big MBE outbreak in the Riverina in the early 1970s. And there was a lot of, then surveillance mechanisms were put in place to monitor for the presence of Murray Valley encephalitis in mosquitoes and in chicken flocks, because they're used around the world to, to survey for flaviviruses. Um, and these were then designed to be early warning systems for MVE. So these flocks have been placed, and you can see on the map, they, they vary a bit each year and so on. Uh, so you have mosquito trapping, uh, uh, inland and you have uh, chicken sentinel flocks inland as well. And these flocks are often 10 to 15 birds caged um, uh, humanely outside uh, in the environment so they can be bitten by mosquitoes, usually looked after by local vets or farmers, uh, bled weekly uh, with a, uh, not a finger prick, but a, a wing prick onto a bit of filter paper and antibodies uh, for, for MVE and Kunjan uh, uh, detected. Uh, so those systems have been in place for a long, long time um, and have, you know, proved to be a warning system of, of MVE activity, which has intermittently occurred. Um, so what was done was just overlay JE on top of all of this. So retrospectively went back and tested for antibodies and, and PCR on the mosquitoes, as well as prospectively testing. So in the prospective testing coming up for the next summer, it'll be the same sort of approach looking for JE as well as MVE and Kunjin. Sorry. Um, mosquito trapping is then um, uh, also put out, as I said, around the piggeries and, and uh, the entomology department uh, uh, do a lot of mosquito trapping um, and are quite experienced at, 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 at doing it. Um, and as I said, picked up a number of um, um, <laughs> viruses and mosquitoes. We did some human sort of testing, some retrospective testing. So we're able to access um, a reasonable number of CSFs from uh, undiagnosed and, uh, uh, CNS disease from a number of different labs around um, uh, New South Wales, and they're all tested. So this is between October and March, uh, early March this year. They're all negative. Um, and then since then, uh, uh, Westmead's done a lot of testing on uh, uh, CSF, uh, uh, brain tissue, urine uh, for PCR, as well as sera uh, 
uh, and CSF uh, for antibody production. Um, and uh, again, essentially for a couple of people were picked up by PCR uh, uh, on CSF and a couple also picked up on uh, because of the presence of Japanese and, uh, encephalitis specific IgM uh, on, on the CSF. I'm not going to go into the laboratory testing, um, I'm not sure I've got the time, but the, the, the diagnosis of encephalitis is tricky. Most of them are diagnosed by I, presence of IgM in, in the CSF, um, but PCR, of course, is, is also very good. But you'll certainly have people that are PCR negative but IgM positive um, in the same way that you might have people who don't produce IgM but are PCR positive. Uh, one of the problems is that the viremia is very short with, with uh, Japanese encephalitis, so often by the time the patients present, you've missed the, the picture. Um, so we also have been doing some sero surveys. I've done a range of these or doing a range of these now in conjunction with ENSERS and the, the ministry and, and, and uh, I think people at the Kirby as well. So we've already tested a couple of hundred piggery workers uh, in New South Wales. And, um, you know, a number of those have actually been sero positive for JE. And we're currently uh, doing studies in uh, Coroa, Tamora, Griffith, Bal Ranald, and Dubbo, um, uh, looking for uh, evidence of, uh, of, of seropositivity in them. And there's also a study uh, planned nationally uh, for looking at, at, at blood donors uh, and so on. Remembering, of course, I guess that blood donors tend to be adult patients, uh, tend to be, at, well, or adults, um, uh, so missing the pediatric population. So those studies are under, underway, um, but already certainly positives are being identified. Now, the tricky part, as I was saying before, is that not only is the diagnosis of encephalitis tricky uh, with, with, with flavivirus, and I'll just refer you, there's a paper coming out in pathology by David Pham, who's one of our registrars, who goes through the diagnostic testing of JE in all its detail, and so I recommend that to you if you're interested. Um, but, uh, you know, there are a couple of things you need to know when doing these sero surveys, um, because... For example, in the piggeries, there's a fair proportion of people who come in from overseas, you know, on specific visas to work in piggeries uh, and indeed in abattoirs as well. Um, and, and so you need to know a number. You can't just take, it's not like doing SARS-CoV-2 zero surveys. You really do need to have some clinical information to help you interpret the test result. So you need to know whether people have been, you know, lived in endemic areas for MVE, MVE for example, because they will throw up a false positive. You need to know if they've been exposed overseas, you know, have they come from countries where flaviviruses, including dengue, but indeed JE, are endemic. Um, also the, the, the occupation, of course, like with piggery workers and so on, um, and their age and their travel and their exposures and so on, again, become important in trying to interpret serology, particularly in adults, whether they've been vaccinated in the past, not commonly done in Australia, except for travellers, but common in other parts of the world, of course. And dif differentiating primary infection is usually pretty straightforward, but differentiating perhaps a second flavivirus infection or a, a flavivirus infection following another prior vaccination, those sorts of things become really difficult. And there's really quite extensive cross-reaction between the flaviviruses. And this has bedeviled a lot of, 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 of uh, arbovirus serology. The approach we're taking with the sero surveys is to do a JE-specific defined epitope blocking EIA, um, uh, which, which works very well. And then any positive test, say if 10% positive, say, then they're going to need to be traded. We need probably do, well, we will do an IgM as well, just to make sure they haven't got more recent infection. The IgM can persist for, for some time. And of course, given where in New South Wales these samples are being collected, then we're also going to have to test anybody positive for MVE and Kunjan uh, as well. Now, with the genomics, uh, we're talking about um, uh, genome group four, as I mentioned, and uh, there's been a J virus diagnostics working group form, uh, which has taken, I must say, you know, to its credit, a, a real One Health approach to genomics. So involving the agricultural industry, the public health veterinary labs, as well as uh, 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 human labs, um, and, and all contributing and sharing the genomes across the different animal species. And those genomes have come from humans, of course, 
uh, but also from commercial feral pigs and mozzies and birds and, and so on. And again, uh, without going to the detail, there, there are probably looks as though there are two sort of clades within the gene of group four. Um, but of course, all the animal and human uh, uh, genomes go across both clades. So one clade isn't related to a specific host. Uh, the, down the bottom, you can see that's the Tiwi Islands genome from a couple of years ago. Um, and you know, it does sit, even though it's genome group four, it does sit aside a, a little bit from all of the others. And one of the issues is accessing genomes from that 2000 and, and, and uh, uh, between the Tiwi Islands case and the current cases um, and, and trying to fill in the gaps in that time period. But interestingly, since I put this together, uh, there is a feral pig uh, genome that's come through from the Northern Territory, much more closely related to the Tiwi Islands genome. So the bridge between the Tiwi Islands genome and the other ones uh, is perhaps becoming easier. The other thing you've got to do, of course, is look at the weather. Um, and as we are all well aware, the Australian weather has been dominated by La Nina. Uh, uh, and this has meant exceptional rainfall and flooding uh, across much of inland Australia. Uh, I, I, I remember going on a holiday um, during the COVID lockdown when you could just travel within New South Wales and going out to Menindee Lakes and the Darling River and so on. And, you know, the amount of water was absolutely outstanding, uh, astounding, as were the bird populations and so on. I've never seen anything like it. Uh, so there's a lot of rain, a lot of water, a lot of pooling of water. Uh, the above average rainfall is great, of course, for mosquitoes. Um, the water birds stay there because the water's there and the food is there. So the mosquitoes and the water birds are all there. We still don't know quite the pathway of how Jay got in, whether it's you know, undoubtedly through migratory birds, possibly mosquitoes that have been blown over. Uh, um, uh, that's a theory. Um, but certainly the climatic conditions were very favourable for the spread um, uh, of, of Japanese encephalitis. Of course, once winter comes and the temperature drops, the mosquitoes go. Uh, so that's why there's been no activity now as the water, uh, as the, the weather's cooled. And of course, you know, there's a whole discussion discussion, of course, about our changing climate. We'll point out that this has all happened before. We've been through this, a similar scenario back uh, a decade or so ago with flooding in southeast Australia. Uh, again, a La Nina effect um, and quite significant flooding at the time. And as part of that, uh, surveillance showed a large or record numbers of mosquitoes and viruses, and that included Barma Forest and, and Ross River virus from Western New South Wales, and also serial conversion of sentinel chickens in a couple of states to Murray Valley and Kefalitis. And there were actually one or two cases of MVE uh, uh, associated with fatality. Uh, and also emergence of Kunjan virus or this sort of strain of West Nile virus, not necessarily terribly important in Australia anyway for encephalitis, but very important in the equine industry because of disease that it causes. So in other words, the flooding and the, the mosquito bird virus interaction has happened before. It's just that this time it's with Japanese encephalitis. So in summary, you know, to, to get to this sort of scenario, you need a, a range of risk conditions. Uh, and then to try and manage it, you need to monitor that sort of risk. So the weather we've sort of talked about, you need the right vectors, of course, which you'll identify with trapping. You need the virus to be present. Uh, and, and that's a matter of sort of monitoring the potential reservoir hosts and so on. Uh, you need the virus present in the mosquitoes, uh, again, picked up with trapping and so on understanding amplification in particular with pigs and JE uh, is, is really important. And that hasn't been done before because the animal amplification isn't a feature of some of these others. Then of course, you need the infected mozzies biting susceptible humans and animals. So again, the chicken uh, flocks, the human serial surveillance and so on uh, is, is important. And if you get enough people uh, and enough animals, depending on the virus, getting infected, uh, by uh, the mosquitoes, then you start to get clinical cases. So the clinical cases are very much at the end. So in terms of what's happening now with JE uh, over winter when things have got a bit 
quieter. It's a matter of planning for next summer and the onset of the mosquito season. So the surveillance, the communications about what to do to avoid mosquitoes, which is really the main kind of thing you can do uh, is managing those transmission risks. Getting in place the zero surveys that I've uh, discussed already, Pick, you know, ensuring that our laboratory diagnosis diagnostics and genomics are, are working well and I think there's been very good progress in that as I alluded to with the genomics and then working out vaccine strategies uh, for occupational uh, uh, scenarios such as the piggery workers and indeed laboratory workers so we have uh, a number of our laboratory workers uh, vaccinated for JE because of work they do in our uh, uh, biosecurity lab at Westmead. But what we do for the general community in those areas is still to be uh, sorted out. And a lot of that will depend on what things like, what are shown in things like the Ciro surveys. In terms of managing the mosquitoes, there are already actually quite comprehensive mosquito management plans. Um, and uh, the, the environmental health uh, branch of New South Wales Health run this each year. Um, and you, you know, you probably see that um, a lot of that's got to do with the coastal viruses like, Jay, uh, like uh, uh, Ross River and Barma Forest, uh, although they can be inland, of course, um, and people going on holidays, but also inland as well. The understanding and promotion of uh, personal protection measures and uh, many of you may know Cameron Webb, who's always on the radio, talking about the appropriate uh, mosquito protection measures that are, that are useful and those that are not useful. Um, and indeed, then now starting to think through what sort of more sophisticated surveillance we can do um, uh, with JE. And these are just some of the, the, the sort of documents and so on that are available. Um, and, and some of them, of course, have a very strong uh, veterinary focus, uh, naturally. Now, we do have vaccines, of course, for Japanese encephalitis. Um, as I said in the beginning, this has mostly been done around uh, travellers uh, and perhaps a few lab and other workers. Um, but there are a range of them that are used around the world, most of them based on genogroup genotype 3. Um, and um, uh, the, the ones that are available in Australia, there's the older inactivated uh, vaccine, which is a, a couple of injections uh, a month apart. Um, and then there's a newer uh, live chimeric vaccine, uh, which is, uh, you know, a yellow fever, JE, um, um, chimera. Uh, chimera. And, and uh, um, you know, that has certain um, uh, advantages in being a single dose and so on, but certain contraindications and so on. Uh, and that's all available, of course, on, in the immunisation handbook. What we don't really know is what the strategy is going to be for vaccination for people, um, uh, particularly in those parts of Australia that have been affected. Uh, you clearly can't do everybody, um, but, but what's going to be done is, is, is um, still uncertain. So finishing up now. Um, so look, obviously, lots of unknowns. The big one is, was this a once-off or will it become endemic? And the implications of that, of course, are enormous. If it's a one-off, well, then fine. You know, we've, we've been through it. Um, but I think the likelihood is it's going to be endemic. The conditions are conducive for ongoing activity in terms of weather patterns and so on. Um, uh, uh, we, as I mentioned, there are things like uh, uh, the water is going to be around for a long, long time anyway, even if it doesn't rain uh, anymore, it's still going to rain. La Nina is going to continue on for a bit longer anyway. So, so the conditions are certainly conducive for ongoing activity. Um, the other thing is too that uh, not in New South Wales, but certainly in South Australia, they did have isolates of Murray Valley encephalitis as well. So not only is it a JE threat, but the same conditions that promote JE are also, uh, uh, you know, can promote or conducive to Murray Valley encephalitis. So, you know, um, that has obviously implications. Importantly, this is a national issue, as I kind of alluded to in the beginning, needing a national approach to surveillance and methodologies, not just in, in surveillance, but in laboratory methods and uh, genomic analyses and all of those sorts of things. Another key point, of course, is the cooperation that's needed between uh, industry and government and research. And, you know, those interactions can be uh, fraught with difficulties at times, but um, 
uh, so that's something that needs to be watched. There's obviously a lot of knowledge gaps related to JE in Australia in terms of the vectors and the animals and the extent of infection in wild and domestic animals and so on. And also indeed what's going to happen with climate change and weather and, and so on, not just now, but in, in, the, in, the, in the future. Uh, and of course, there's still work around the diagnostics and uh, so on. The vaccine strategies have got to be worked out. And of course, uh, antiviral treatments are, are you know, essentially non-existent for, for this. Uh, so there's still plenty of work to be done. So look, I'll stop there. Uh, thanks, Gail. And, and, and just acknowledge a lot of people who've uh, done a lot of work um, at, in virology at Westmead and at Wimmer uh, in medical entomology who've been at the forefront of a lot of this work for many, many years in our serology department, and also colleagues at uh, uh, NSERS and, and uh, DPI, Vinnie's, uh, environmental health and, and, and others involved in the diagnostics of our working group. I'm sure I've left out others as well. So I'll, I'll stop there and be happy to answer any uh, questions. Thank you, Dominic. That was a, a, an excellent um, talk, really fascinating and, and also um, incredibly comprehensive. Your talk was incredibly comprehensive, but what I think for me um, personally, sort of listening to that was, um, you know, it's not just fascinating from the clinical perspective as an ID physician, but the whole um, response to this from all those different areas that you, you talked about in, in so much detail. And, and as I said, a really comprehensive response um, uh, in general. So we've got um, a few minutes for questions and I, I can see um, that uh, there are some coming. So I'm going to try and get through uh, some of those, um, if you don't mind. Um, so first, Michaela's has asked, um, so do you think there has been a low level of um, JE genotype 4 circulating, um, or is this something that's really uh, a new introduction? Uh, and what are the genotypes of the circulating JE in, in neighbouring countries? Yeah. Um, so look, uh, in, in many countries, a number of different genotypes circulate. Um, and in certainly in Indonesia and, and, and PN, a number of uh, genotypes circulate, one, two, four, uh, for example, although four has always been at a lower level. Um, so there's a range of them. They don't occupy the one niche. Um, uh, so, so there's a range of them. Um, and look, I think the feeling is that probably this genotype um, and JE, the virus, has probably been in, in Australia for longer than we realise. It came to attention late last year in the piggeries, um, but some of the work on feral pigs and so on in the Northern Territory showed that the virus was probably there at least six months or so beforehand. So it may well be that it was circulating before we really realised. And whether it was there last summer then overwintered and came back up, sorry, the summer before, and then came back up last summer, I think is, well, I don't think we know. Um, and we've got a few questions here that are all around the same kind of area, which is really, so maybe we can do with them all together, which is really about cross protection and cross reactivity. Um, and so, uh, um, I think Rowena has asked, so due to cross-reactivity between G E complex, would you expect people who've previously had Conjun or MVE to have protection? So is the cross-reactivity between um, the different um, viruses? Um, and then is there also cross-protection between the different genotype-based vaccines as well? So maybe just some comment about, yeah, about look, that. Yeah, Rowena, I'm not sure of the answer to, to, to all of those. It is stated that the genotype 3 vaccines do protect against the other genotypes. Okay, so whether that's, but the data on genotype four is scanty. So the assumption is it will, but we don't know, to be honest. Um, whether you, if you've had Kunjun or MVE in the past, are you likely to have some protection? I don't know, but probably. <laughs> it's not very helpful, but I, I, I think, I just don't think we know. Uh, and I think there's work that's got to be done in that sort of area and there's know. nothing to suggest it's like dengue whereby cross reactivity reactivity between serotypes may actually give you a worse um clinical uh, I, I i don't think so but i don't i, I don't think anyone knows mm -hmm. um, but you don't seem to see that kind of uh in areas where j is endemic even where there's multiple genotypes circul circulating there haven't been descriptions of worse disease if you have a second infection with another genotype yep. which is the sort of thing that happens yeah Thank you. Yeah. Great. Thanks. And I think we've just got time for one more because we're at two o'clock and it's from John Caldor. And, and John is saying, um, Dominic, thanks. So how confident are we that we know all the reservoirs for animal species? 
for, for how confident hmm. uh, uh, slightly confident uh, I mean I think look uh, uh, yeah look I think the the issue is perhaps not the type of the 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 the, the, the host but the amount of the host so you know we know a range of water birds can be infected um, but what's possibly what we don't know is uh are water birds in, you know, Lake Eyre, Menindee Lakes, the Darling River, you know, the Murray down in South Australia, is the rate of infection in those birds the same everywhere? Is it always high? Is it sometimes low? Uh, so I don't think we know that um, uh, degree. Whether there's other animal reservoirs, I don't know. Um, covered a fair few of them already but i'm not aware of any for example specific australian you know animals that are at risk of this and we have given that we don't think we've had jay before it's hard to imagine that any local animals are a natural vector of this a natural host of this um and just very one last quick question is jay vaccination routine anywhere in the world i think it probably is in the endemic it is yeah, yeah i think it, yeah yeah no, and any idea of when it becomes cost effective? I guess that's more difficult. No idea, but uh, um, uh, look, I think it's a really, it's actually very tricky, uh, Gail, to work out, you know, what the vaccination strategy is mm. because, you know, do you do everybody, which is sort of what you think you might have to do in those parts, but you know, just because you live in Sydney doesn't mean you don't go to the, you know, Wagga Base Hospital or work or have a holiday or whatever, you know. So, so I think it's actually tricky uh, the whole vaccine strategy. Mm. All right. Well, I think that's um, it's a bit of a watch this space, isn't it? I guess over you know what happens yeah, for the next so. yeah. year or so in terms of the, the approach that's taken. But um, that's been really fascinating. Thank you so much, Dominic, for coming no, and talking to us today. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>